right? Have you guys cooked with it before? You know how it gets hot fast, it holds on to that heat for a very long time, and has a lovely tendency to, well, have gotten wet and exposed to oxygen, known as rust. And, and since they were in the lake, they are very, very rusty. Basically stating what he's willing to give, what he's wanting to take. And then that letter basically states that Ma Tom is willing to let Monroe leave this fort with all of his men intact, with all the clothes on their backs, with all their weapons at hand, and with their flags proudly flying high. And he's going to give Monroe and all of his men a day to pack up everything here inside this fort. To which Ma Tom's going to give Monroe a couple of his French soldiers as escorts so that they can safely escort the British soldiers down the military pathway, leading them straight to Fort Edward. They're going to be stationed there for the remainder of this surrender. All right, folks, so we're welcome to the parade it. ground of Fort William Henry. This would have been uh, the original parade ground, but it would have felt a lot uh, uh, more congested because there were four buildings and then today there are only two. The one that you see here and the one behind me. I don't, that one actually wasn't supposed to be here this year, so I'm just ignoring it, uh, uh, pretending it's not here like we were told it wasn't going to be. So that is uh, what is one of the barracks. Uh, the other twin to that would have been on the other side here. Uh, and those two barracks would have contained five, uh, 400 men. Uh, that's officer barracks there, and uh, offices and non-commissioned officers barracks would have been over there, but we don't have one there. Uh, things of interest, there are three floors in this uh, building to explore, two floors in the building behind me to explore. In the corner there, beyond the staircase, is where the gunpowder was, down into the powder magazine. Uh, all the way underneath the uh, northeast bastion, uh, covered with several layers of logs and sand uh, alternating so that a direct hit uh, wouldn't set it off. Uh, in the defensive wall uh, on that side is the Native American exhibit uh, next to the AV room where you just were. And over there, the John Farrell archeological exhibit. Sounds a little dry. It's, the under, it's what they found under the lake uh, and in uh, numerous dives. Uh, the different uh, boats uh, that were used during this war, a uh, warship that was built specifically for this war, uh, and uh, uh, so it's quite interesting in that department. Now, um, uh, the one last thing I'll point out to you in the, uh, uh, in the parade ground here, uh, that cannon over there, which has actually been taken apart, the carriage is half apart, and the barrel is sitting on the ground behind it. The barrel being the part of the cannon that goes boom. All right, that cannon, it's the only cannon that is original to this fort. And it's not original to the fort per se. It was used by the French to bombard this fort. And they left it here because they knew we would be a museum someday. <laughs> oh, they, they dropped it in the lake and it weighs 3,000 pounds. So divers found it. Um, which is why it's sitting over there while its carriage gets rebuilt. It is could, in some ways part of the underwater archaeology exhibit. Divers found it and they brought up that 3,000 pound hunk of iron and uh, found French markings all over it, which means that it was a French cannon, and the only time a cannon, a French cannon of that size was in the lake was when it was on its way here or on its way home after firing out the during its siege. Now, when you look at the length of that cannon barrel, uh, when you get up close to it, keep in mind this thought. That is only the third largest cannon that they brought here. Okay. They brought, that's an 18-pounder, fires an 18-pound cannonball about a mile and a half brought 24 pounders and 30 pounders here and that's a 32 pound cannonball firing uh, uh it's moving at about a thousand miles an hour through the air and it uh, goes about two miles before it uh, runs out of energy so um uh anyway uh that's the cannon's original fort cannon you see over here actually came off the bottom of the ocean that's why they're in such bad repair uh, but they were going into the fort. They came off with warships that sank during this time period. But when the fort was rebuilt in the 1950s, it didn't have any crown of its own. Not until we found that one, until those were donated to us. And then other people started to uh, donate replicas, uh, et cetera, that you see around the fort here today. Uh, now, of the original fort, there's a base in the basement there. There is a um, fireplace. Uh, that is original to the fort. The base of the well is original to the fort, and the walkway down to the powder magazine, some of those stones are original. And everything else is a reconstruction because the French pulled down all the logs, and that was the, all of the construction other than the dirt in those dirt walls uh, in between those logs. And so uh, what was left brought it away, uh, and uh, the dirt stayed here until the 1950s when they did rebuild it. Now, uh, what I'm here to talk to you about, actually, is what I have in my hand, 
what I have in my hand should explain to you by the end of the talk why I'm wearing bright red. Because uh, particularly, uh, how many of you are Americans, by the way? Okay. Almost everyone here. All right. Now, um, uh, you guys are coming up on your 250th anniversary in two years. It'll be 250 years uh, from 1776, uh, the year you declared your independence from the King of England. Ungrateful traitors, you. <laughs> right. But um, uh, a big myth about uh, uh, that is cherished uh, and taught in schools still today is that you Americans won the war against us British because we are morons and we stand in lines and wear bright colors and you stand behind trees and pick us off at your leisure until we get tired of dying and go home. Right. Uh, and uh, not, I'm not trying to dispel that myth completely. You did have men who were capable of doing that. Uh, they, they were capable of doing that because they were very well trained with a very specific tool. And that specific tool is called a rifle. This is not it. Right? No, almost no one carried rifles back then for the very simple reason that they were extremely difficult to make, which made them extremely expensive. So uh, uh, monarchs did not equip armies with rifles. Uh, the only country that's starting to use rifles as part of their army are Germans. They are known as Jaegers or Hunters, uh, and uh, eventually uh, other European armies will adopt them. But uh, the Germans that were in the uh, uh, army, uh, German army as Jaegers, some of them settled in Pennsylvania, and they'll uh, start to develop their own style of rifle there, known as the Pennsylvania Long Rifle eventually becomes known as the Kentucky Long Rifle. By the Revolution, some men were carrying those things, but they couldn't have won the war by themselves. One, there weren't very many of them because there weren't many rifles. Uh, and two, there weren't many men who were well trained enough to use them. And three, if they had tried to fight all on their own, they would have lost disastrously because yes, you can kill a man at 350 yards, right? But it takes you two minutes to reload a rifle, right? Which means I've got two minutes to cover that 350 yards and hit you over the head with a rock, right? And then your expensive weapon and all that training isn't going to do you much good anymore. And so uh, uh, most armies equipped themselves with these. They gave up accuracy and what they gave up in accuracy, they gained in speed. Two minutes to reload a rifle, 20 seconds to reload this, right? And that's because it has no grooves on the inside. Grooves are what make, makes a rifle dangerous. Grooves putting a spin on the ball as it leaves. Those of you fans of your American football game know that when the quarterback throws it, he puts a spin on the ball and it goes straight and true as far as he wants it to, to the man he wants it to go to. And I try and throw it with a spin on it. I can't seem to get a spin on it. So what it does is this through the air and drops about 10 feet in front of me. And that's the difference between a rifle and a musket. See, this can't put a spin on a ball because it has no grooves, but that's what makes it cheap. But the advantage is, since I know the ball's not going to spin, it doesn't have to fit tightly where a rifle ball does. Because the only way it can get pick up spin from the grooves is if it fits tight inside that barrel. And that's the problem because you have to load it from this end. And those Kentucky rifles were this long. When you push up a tight fit ball down that length of a barrel, takes you two minutes. Whereas this, since I don't have grooves, I don't need a tight fitting ball. So what I have here is a 69 caliber musket ball. And I have a 75 caliber barrel to put it down. So that's a big difference. 0.69 inches in diameter, 0.75 inches in diameter. So this will go right down and I only have to tap it once to make sure that it's loaded. Now it'll come out wobbly. It won't come out spinning. But if I can fire one of these every 20 seconds, and if, uh, because the British Army trained so hard, they only had to fight in two rows. You ever hear the expression, a thin red line? It's describing the British Army. That's what it was originally intended to do. Describe just the two rows of men. Because every other army fought in three or four ranks because they weren't fast enough. So they fought in three ranks, so that one, or four ranks, so when one row is firing, the next rows are reloading. Whereas in the British Army, since they could reload so fast, they just took turns back and forth and back and forth. And that thin row of British soldiers wearing red uniforms is a thin red line that because it can fire so fast, can stop anything in its tracks coming at it. And that was the key to mass musket fire. You bunch them together, you throw a lot of lead at the enemy, and you wait till they get close. And you do that because you're so inaccurate that anything further than 50 yards is a waste of ammunition. 
Now I just said 50 yards. If you think back to the pictures that you've seen in textbooks of battles being fought, those are done by painters who are trying to make a good book and save some money on canvas and paint by moving everyone this close together and having them shoot at each other at this range. Now, if men actually fought at that distance, standing in rows, wearing bright colored uniforms, Charles Darwin had something wrong, all right, about evolution. Because no species that stupid should ever make it to the top of the food chain, right? No, they fought at 30 to 50 yards, right? Now, 50 yards is still pretty close. It's the wall there to the wall over there. And 30 yards is even closer. There it is, that wall to that wall. Right? That's the distance you fire. Now anything beyond 50 yards is a waste of your ammunition. Most of your shots will miss. And you only have somewhere between 26, was a standard British issue, 26 rounds up to about 60. And after that, you're not carrying that many. So you're not going to waste it at the enemy any further away than that. Because most of those shots will miss. So uh, you wait to get, get close. If they get any closer than uh, 30 yards, that's when these things come out. You hear the order to fix bayonets? Everybody puts that on. The enemy hears that even through the, all the smoke and confusion of battle. So what that means is when they come out of the smoke market shin at you, you're gonna be standing in line like this. And you'll give them one volley first, and then you'll start march marching at them. All right, and since you've got 18 inches of persuasion on your musket, and it's pointed at their belly, there's an excellent chance that they're gonna start walking backwards before you get there. Because no fella is gonna stand there and go, gee, Bob, I don't know, I don't think he's gonna do it. Do you? All right, so a bayonet was a very effective tool of persuasion, very little used on uh, men, unless it's really tight quarters, like a fight over the fort, or if you're already hit, you're already lying down. Doctors found bayonet wounds only on men who were already wounded. They were already, and they were bayoneted for one of two reasons, and I'm sure both, probably both were equally valid reasons uh, and happened about the same rate. One would be at walking by an enemy and you're angry because you just lost your buddy, all right? And you're um, angry because you're stuck in this stupid bloody war uh, and you walk past them and you stick them because you're angry, all right? Or you walk past a fella and he looks an awful lot like you, all right, uh, just wearing a different colored uniform and he's been shot in the abdomen, which means he's only got, oh, three weeks to live and it's gonna be awful. And if you were in his shoes, you hope somebody would do this to you as well. It's a terrible thing to talk about, but war is a terrible thing, okay? uh, particularly in the days before medicine, uh, but medicine may be able to fix men now like it couldn't before, but, hey, but it doesn't fix them completely. Okay? So uh, uh, war continues to be a terrible thing. Uh, oh, by the way, that musket ball, just to, know what you, to let you know what kind of damage it can do, it doesn't look very big, but it weighs an ounce because it's lead, which means you're being hit by the equivalent weight of a AA battery moving at 1,000 miles an hour through the air. Here's the good news. They won't start shooting at you until you get reasonably close. Now, um, uh, to load and fire this, you have to understand what makes it go bang. Uh, I have to get a spark into the gunpowder behind the ball. I load the powder in the ball from the main part, but the spark has to come in from the back. And so what I have is a little hole in the side of the barrel, in the back of the rifle. And I need to get a spark through that. So that spark's gonna come from a piece of flint striking against steel. This is in a safe position right now, and there's nothing in the rifle, so it makes it safe to load. And I got a little pan here next to the little hole, and inside that little pan, I'll put some gunpowder so that when the flint strikes down against the steel, drops a spark into the pan, the powder in the pan will go poof, and hopefully some of that will go through the hole and set off the main charge down the weapon. And that is the most efficient way to set off a weapon for over 140 years, because that's how long this is in service. Uh, now, um, some things about uh, the musket terms that you may have heard. You may have heard the old expression, you don't want to go off half cock. Well, this is in the half cock position, and you pull the trigger and it doesn't go. And that's a good eye thing. Now, why would it call be called half cock? Because if you use your imagination, and instead of the drill sergeant saying to the men, all right, boys, see this here? This is the spring-loaded torsion arm with a piece of metamorphic rock in its screw clamp jaws that is trigger activated and will snap down and make the sparky thing. You just say, see that fella thing that looks like there? It's, look, it's got a beak, it's got a scrawny neck, and it's got a thing on top of its head. Doesn't that look like a rooster, fellas? 
Okay, so we're gonna call that the cock of the gun, all right, and we're gonna pull that halfway back. There, now it's in half cock position. A, a thing comes out on Sunday saying, oh, well, it turns out musket balls are good for tourism, so fire away. All right, no. Uh, anyway, um, so now to get this open, well, but by the way, there's two requirements to get into the British Army, all right, uh, other than being male and Protestant. Uh, you had to be tall enough to reload the musket. Now, the standard British musket was not this. The standard British musket, if I sit it on the ground, it'd be right up here. I'm 5'6". I'm the minimum height to be in the British Army. And the reason why is you have to reload it from this end. And look what happens if I get shorter than 5'6". See, it gets difficult to reload, particularly if I have to use the ramrod. So you had to be 5'6". Now, the problem with the Scots is that the average Scotsman, because of a poor diet, getting into the British Army was only five foot two inches tall. Right, so they've got themselves a choice. They gotta issue every Scotsman a step stool if they're gonna let him into the army, or they gotta give him a shorter musket, and that's exactly what they do. They give him a shorter musket. Now I'm sure in the British locker rooms, Scots took a little abuse for having a shorter musket, but this only weighs seven pounds, and the standard British issue is 14 pounds. So this is a lot nicer to have to carry around. Now, the other requirement to get in the British Army is to be able to open this when both hands are full. How are you gonna do that? You're gonna use your teeth. So, if this is anti 18th century, folks, dental hygiene in the 18th century isn't what it is today. So they would check to make sure that you had at least two. So they do have to oppose each other, because if one's here and one's there, can't do that. It's loose. Paper on top will help hold it in place when I shove it down. But I'm not putting down a musket ball, so I'm not going to put down the paper. Okay, but I do have to put something down there to make sure the powder gets smooshed down. So I'm going to use this little fiber wad, just made of paper, uh, wood fiber. Okay, and I'll just shove that down. It'll disintegrate when I pull the trigger. <laughs> have to be able to do that every 15 to 20 seconds. And while you're doing it, men are firing right over your shoulder, right? Until it's your turn to fire while they're reloading. And remember those painters that moved those guys, everybody really close together? And that was a little bit deceiving. Well, there's another deception that they did, but it was a sin of omission, not commission, all right? Think about what I'm about to show you and then think about what the painters left out. Make ready. Oh, there's going to be a noise here. Present. Give by a... Oh, oh my. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Uh, now. Now. Obviously, the painters can't paint sound. But what did they leave out? Oh my God. The smoke. Yeah. Now, the smoke drifted away here. Because it'll do that when only one person fires a musket. When hundreds of people fire the musket, it doesn't move at all. It just hangs there because sound is a pressure wave. It keeps other breezes from coming in and moving it out because you're firing pressure wave after pressure wave after pressure wave over and over and there's guys just 30, 40 yards away who are blasting back at you at the same time. And so that pressure wave keeps just holds your smoke in one spot right in front of your face. So the only time a command to aim would be appropriate was for your first shot. Because after that, you're just shooting into your own smoke and the fellow who's in smoke, who are just firing right over your shoulder because you're chewing on that smoke. The enemy is creating their own cloud of smoke. Now, put that into your paintings and tell me that lines and bright colored uniforms don't make sense. They make perfect sense if you add all that smoke. In fact, the safest place for me to be is right next to half the guys who were firing. The other half were firing at me. I can't do anything about that. But if I step one step in front of them, in all that smoke, I've just definitely increased my chances of being shot by one of my own folks by accident, particularly if you spread out even more, or one part of the unit got detached. And the only thing you can do to make sure you rely on people not shooting you by accident in those circumstances is to be wearing bright colors. Because friendly fire isn't very friendly, and it can't see colors, so it relies on people to do that. Now, if you get lost on a battlefield and you can't find lines of your men, your own colors, you 
try and look above the smoke because every regiment carried really big flags and you rallied around that flag if you got lost. The flags are so important that if you really want to be a hero and you get a medal and never buy a drink again in your life, you capture an enemy's flag. You ever hear the game Capture the Flag before? Yeah. All right? And you guard your flags with your best men, which is where we got the term color guard from. Now, the British choose red not because it's the best color against white smoke. They're just the f they happen to be the first to choose, and they don't do a five-year study to see how which color stands out best against the smoke. They simply walk into the color store and say, what is your cheapest dye? Red. Take 50,000 units of it, please. What color was the smoke? White. That's a bad idea then, isn't it? Now, they, they realize that after about 40 years, and they'll change over to blue. And then we'll blue from Napoleon right up to uh, World War I. Uh, and uh, the uh, Russians wear dark green, the Prussians wear dark blue, and I'm convinced the Spanish were last in line in that color store because they ended up with the Dijon mustard yellow for their coats and their vests and their weave and their pants. Right? Now I will say this in defense of the Spanish, if it was my very first battle, yellow pants maybe not such a bad idea. Right? Now what color is no one going to wear because it's the most expensive color? Purple. No one wears purple except king. And of course, the Minnesota Vikings, but that's a different place. Okay. So hopefully now you understand a little bit more about why you stood in lines in bright, more bright colored uniforms. It uh, made absolute sense at the time. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, if you'd like to hear another explosion, they're going to be doing the cannon right up the steps right there if you follow the gentleman there. Thanks very much, folks. You've been a lovely audience. Thank, Thank you. you. This is a cannon. It does go boom. And uh, we're hoping for an earth shattering boom, but we've also gotten the equivalent of Uncle Joey's pull my finger joke during Thanksgiving. <laughs> never amusing then, never amusing now. So, you ready, Gunna? Alright. Take care. Make ready. Bye. It's pretty good. Give my gunner a hand. It's going to six, eight, nine. Yeah. So, and King George would oblige by giving you a permit to be a beggar on the streets of London, or wherever your local city is, and uh, get you get to be a beggar uh, without being arrested, uh, harassed, or arrested by the local officials. How gracious is our majesty, folks. Well, this concludes the artillery demonstration of your tour. I can tip my hat to all of you. You are now free to roam around the beautiful sights of Lake George and see the different exhibits here at Fort Wave Henry. You're all now dismissed. Thank you. Another two barracks, but still, it was crowded.
all natural stuff. We have a exploded fragments. Survival gun, a swimming gun. Um, yeah, some, some cool stuff. really cool and also this is a door right here Yo! Yeah, I have so much to Trying to help him, they're trying to help him by cutting. What? 